This is the GTN Show. This week we'll be discussing Zwift running, world number one tennis star trying out triathlon, and some new evidence that running is actually good for your joints. And with the Winter Olympics taking place at the moment, and one of the coldest on record, it's had us thinking how these athletes have prepared for the cold and how they're coping with the cold. So we have a bit of a cold theme to our show this week. Right, so to start things off this week, we thought we'd talk about the Winter Olympics, which are taking place in South Korea in Pyeongchang, where they've had temperatures recorded at minus 16 degrees Celsius. So cold, in fact, that some of the ski equipment has been warped. I know, That's it sounds ridiculous. Crazy, it? isn't it? And it kind of has had us thinking, these athletes that are preparing for the cold and they're having to cope with the cold during their competitions, Whilst we maybe don't have to deal with minus 16 degrees Celsius, we do have to deal with some cold during our training, depending on where you live and for some of those cold races. Yeah, I mean, in the UK this last week, it's been pretty chilly for us, like really cold. And I definitely experienced that on Saturday in this marathon that I did. And it was it was a marathon in like more than one sense of the word. And it, it, it was off-road. And we were running through, the day before there was some snow on the moor, um, we were running through like streams that were probably only just above freezing because the path had turned into just water. And towards the end, I just we just couldn't get warm. And I mean, like, I can't imagine, it was I think about four degrees. I can't imagine what it would be like up a mountain. Because I got to the stage where my hands were stuck like this and I finished. And I just wanted to get your wet clothes off. <laughs> and I was like, trying to sort of claw my, my jumper off. An me. emotional like, day then. It was, yeah, it was tough. And it, but it's just funny how, you know, the cold just suddenly makes everything that much harder, um, psychologically as well, I think. Well, yeah, if you think about it sort of um, from a science perspective, your, your blood flow stops going to your extremities. extremities yeah. So sort of your fingers will feel like ice. They <laughs> yeah. really hurt, like you had the, your claw hands. Um, and then you shiver to try yeah. and create your own warmth and energy. Um, but athletes try and sort of train themselves for this with things like cold showers yeah. every morning, ice baths regularly, and if they keep doing it consecutive, on consecutive days, they can gradually bring, or well, kind of adapt to it, it's, in the same way we sort of do for heat training. Yeah, I think that the, the frustrating thing for winter athletes, it takes a lot longer to, for your body to make the adaptation to cold. So you know, we see athletes for Kona, you know, having um, saunas and a hot bath and the opposite. Um, but actually, it, that can happen in a few weeks. But I think to do it properly for, for your body to adapt to the cold, it's gonna take a lot, lot longer. And, and in like the really long term, your body would start to store more fat which obviously for athletes you don't want around your internal organs but I don't think our winter athletes are quite going to be at that stage no. just yet. I mean I've always struggled with cold weather races. I like to think I'm a hardy British man but I've never raced well in the cold um, but then I've never done any of this kind of training and adaptation uh, but they're obviously are garments and technical clothing that they're wearing as well to try and keep themselves warm. But we also have some other crazy athletes doing some cold stuff. We've got this swimmer at the moment. Yeah, open water swimmer Diego Lopez actually has got himself a big challenge. He's going to need to do some adaptation because he started open water swimming in Hong Kong, so very warm waters. And then last year he swam 15 open water swims in seven different countries. He's now living in New York, so he's already getting a little bit, um, you know, cold adaptation going on there. But but his challenge for this year is to swim seven different open water swims, so one in each continent and he's going to finish in Antarctica. That's cold. Yeah, so he's doing the ice kilometre. Now there's a, actually ISA, which is the ice um, International Ice Swimming Association, which I'm not a member of. And I can't Funnily enough, not me either. Me either. Well, they actually regulate the whether it is a, an ice mile or an ice kilometre, and for that it has to be, the water has to be under five degrees. And probably non-wetsuit, I'm assuming. It is non-wetsuit, so he's opting for the kilometre, but they actually, on their website, they suggest or highly recommend that if you want to do an ice event, so any swim um, under that temperature, you need several seasons of practising. You can't just have a few ice baths and go, oh yeah, I'm ready to go and swim, <laughs> swim a mile, and you think, oh yeah, we could, you know, both of us, we could swim a mile, but I don't think we could in no. water under five degrees. Well, whilst we're talking about swimming, there's been a recent study into how feedback affects our swimming performance. So when we run, we can look at our pace, we can get that from spectators as well as to how we're doing, same for cycling. But when we swim, it's quite hard to check anything like that. It's not like we can just look at our watch quite easily whilst we're swimming hard or even get feedback from spectators. 
So for this study, they used a group of swimmers to do three lots of 400 meters at 80% of their critical swim speed. One was self-paced, the other was with a visual feedback, so sort of looking at a clock. And then finally, they did a voice feedback and the study found that the voice feedback was quite significantly better. The visual feedback was a little bit better and then the self-paced, well, they found that actually the swimmers were doing all sorts of different paces. Do you think, like, have you ever swam with a, a beeper or anything like that? Do you think never, that never done it. So actually really interesting because it's something I've always thought about. Um, you just, you swim up and down in a lane yeah. or open water and you have no idea what pace yeah. you're on. If you're going for it, all guns blazing. It's very hard to sort yeah. of look at a clock as you go. I know like, you know, as a kid doing swimming gardens, you've always got your coach on the side, but they're normally just telling you to go faster. So I mean, it doesn't, would, yeah. doesn't really help in that situation. And and I know like if I'm doing a slower set, then um, you know, in training, I do glance at the clock when I look up, but it'd be interesting. I've never had a, an audio sort of input, so to speak. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested by this, so. Maybe this is one for future video yeah. we could do with a little, a, bit a little of investigation headphone and, maybe. Yeah, watch this space. Last week we saw the launch of the new Zwift running. Well, obviously, we're all very you know, familiar with the Zwift cycling and it's been a massive thing for a lot of triathletes. And they identified this because they invited Lionel Sanders to the launch and Holly Lawrence to the launch. So I think it's going to be a pretty new and exciting way to take your running training. Yeah, definitely. So the idea of this is that you can simply attach a foot pod to your running shoe. And actually, technically, you could just do it outside as well. You can be on your phone, but you probably wouldn't do yeah, that. Yeah, the probably... outbound post might get in the way. Yeah, so <laughs> the idea of it is you do it on a treadmill and some treadmills, very few, but there are some that can actually connect straight to Zwift, so you don't need the foot pod. But what I will be interested in is, does this actually change the gradient of the treadmill as you go? Yeah, so... I guess it must do, otherwise it's like... But it's a weird concept of like, you know, cycling with other people and sort of racing them is, is one thing. And I don't know why, maybe it's just because it's new, but I find it like, hard to think I'm on a treadmill racing because I personally like to go and do running races and I don't really do that many cycling races and the part of the reason for not doing cycling races is that you know the the danger you could come off in a in a big group and I think that's a lot of triathletes would you know relate to that but running I find like I love the excitement of being in a race so I wonder if that that will cross this over. It's a I'm, whole I'm, new world to you here. Yeah it is I'm, I'm quite like excited to try it actually. But talking of running, actually, there's even more reasons to get out and go running. There's been a recent study that's found that running can actually help reduce arthritis. Well, they did a study on marathon runners, and I must admit, I'm not sure that if you measured my joints after my marathon, they'd be any better. But they did use runners who ran far more regularly than, than I do at that distance. Yeah, they used people that are, have done five or more marathons, and they're regularly running 10 or more miles per week. And whereas they found, well, they thought they would find active marathon runners have a reduced or they have an increased risk of arthritis in their joints, they actually found it was the total opposite and actually they had an improved joint health. Now, I know we're trying to sell marathon running to me, but I think I'll still stick to my 10Ks and half marathons. Well, someone else who has been converted, you know, possibly by the marathon is Caroline Wozniacki. So currently the world number one, she ran a marathon or she ran New York marathon, I think four years ago, in a quite respectable time of, I think, 3.26. And she has just recently announced that when she does finish, obviously she's at the top of her game at the moment, but when she does, she's quite interested in going into triathlon. Yeah, and she said quite honestly that she's not interested in going for a time or anything. She actually just wants to do it so that she can eat whatever she wants and that's her main motivation. I like the motivation but I reckon you know, she's a competitor and she ran a fairly decent marathon while still playing tennis. I think she could get, could be one to watch. Yeah, let, let's see whether that's really true. It's time for the weekly poll and we thought it's rather apt with the Winter Olympics going on at the moment to ask you whether you prefer to train in conditions or compete in conditions where you're feeling too hot or whether you prefer the you know, being freezing and competing when it's really cold and what draining. Do you, what do you prefer? Um, I would right now say definitely prefer the heat, but that's because I'm still sort of feeling like I'm shivering from racing on the still weekend. Still warming up from this morning's run. Yeah. Um, you? Well, yeah, I train with a lot of people that actually prefer to be on the colder side, whereas I would much rather be layered up and sweating out. So, yeah, I'm going to go too hot. Fair enough. Well, we want to know which you'd prefer, so make sure you click on the link above my head to vote in the poll. And for last week's poll, we asked you, what was the worst part of triathlon? We had shaping, we had rest days, we had the amount of training, the all the equipment, and in last place, it was other 
and we had people suggesting things like the effect on my bank balance, which was yeah, a few of those. Yeah, which is uh, quite funny and um, had quite a lot of them, as you say. So, and then in joint third place, we had the amount of training with fifteen percent and rest days with fifteen percent, which I'm really surprised I even got one percent. But um, people like don't Crazy. like their rest days. Um, and then in second place, it was chafing with eighteen percent, and then the top of the list in first place, it was all the equipment with 39%. I reckon that's because Martin, not that many people have a, the luxury of a garage like you have and they have to sort of mm. jam it behind their sofa or squeeze it under their bed. You say, even with my garage, uh, everything is spilling out, so um, I'm not doing very well with that either. Okay, and moving to the race news and to some warmer climates after mm. talking about the cold so much, we had the first World Cup of the season taking place in Cape Town with a fast and furious sprint distance triathlon. Yeah, it was. I mean, the first big race of the season for, for short distance stuff and the first race in a long time for the winner, Vicky Holland of Great Britain. She's been out for nine months injured, last could be did in Yokohama, um, and then came out and won this by about 40 seconds over her teammate, Non Sanford, and they worked together really well on the bike as group of six actually but the swim was led out by young Hungarian Zanet Bragmeier who ended up getting a third her first podium finish for a World Cup so an exciting race but you're still so early in the season to see what athletes are doing yeah and I understand it was a fast race behind as well she was being chased by Edie and Clamour so she managed to hang on to that third um, and then on to the men's race no surprises it was led out in the swim by Henry Schumann mm -hmm. um, and then that formed a front pack with uh, Richard Murray and they sort of moved away of a uh, also, there was a fast moving chase pack with the likes of Grant Sheldon pushing the pace on the front. Um, but they managed to lead off with a sizable gap, and Richard Murray just took off. Yeah, it was a running race again, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and pretty incredible splits on the run. I think it was a low 15 minute 5K. Very fast. And in second place, it was Henry Schumann. And then in third place, it was Austrian athlete Lucas Pertl with his first ever World Cup podium. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting to see this time of year, these new athletes and be great to see how they get on for the rest of the season, like getting on the podiums so early for Austria and Hungary. But going to the other end of the spectrum of athletes, a, a more mature athlete, we saw you know, sadly retiring from triathlon Gwen Jorgensen last year, but talking of fast 5Ks, she has just run her first race, I think in nine years, or first race on track in nine years. Her previous PB was a 15.52, which is still, you know, going some. She just ran a 15.15. That's fast. Yeah, and on an indoor track, I mean, admittedly, sometimes indoor can be a bit quick, you don't have the wind resistance, but um, considering she's training for marathon and it's her first race back since giving birth, it obviously shows that she's been doing some serious training. Definitely, yeah, and she's put a video up online and it does actually show her having a slightly slower start than most of the other girls, but she works her way back through the field and I think she's with three other girls as they sort of push the pace on and eventually it comes down to pretty much a sprint finish. There's yeah. literally two tenths of a second in it. Wow, well, I know she's been obviously doing some work on speed and I think at the moment she's about up to 80 miles a week and she's got to get to around 120 miles a week to, to really get her training nailed for marathon. So she's got the speed there, now she needs to add in the endurance. But talking of endurance, there was a mega endurance race last yeah, weekend. Yeah, this, this is something very different because it involves running, mountain running, mountain biking, road cycling, kayaking, everything, yeah. over 242 kilometers. Um, I mean, it can be spread over a couple of days, but the top yeah. guys do it in sort of 11 hours-ish. Yeah, well, this was down in New Zealand, the South Island. It's the coast-to-coast -coast iconic race. And actually, last year, there was triathlete Braden Curry came second in it, and it was Sam Clark in the men's race who beat him, and he's defended his title, won it for the third year in a row. I mean, it's quite a specialist thing for, for a triathlete to be able to go and do as well. Oh, absolutely. It sounds, sounds fantastic. It's my sort of thing, actually. I love this. Um, so, yeah, it... It sounds stunning. And on the women's side, it was Robin Owen that took the win as well. Okay, now for the caption competition. And last week, we had an image of Alistair Brownlee on the start line of the Ironman 70.3 Dubai, looking quite pleased and smiling, whereas everyone else was looking quite nervous. Uh, so we had some good comments coming in. Firstly, from Martin Kelly, a little un -PC, so apologies for, um, for this. He said, Ali B, internal thoughts. Loving this nice warm pee. That's such boy humour. I thought it was funny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No wonder Mark chose that one. Well, the winner is P.S. Tan, who says, GTN has proven smiling can make you fa go faster. Well, P.S. well, very observed, actually, yeah. because we had a whole piece on that, and I agree. 
GTN cap coming your way. But for this week, we have another image from Iron Man 70.3 Dubai. And it's a rather shady guy on the start line with his mobile phone doing some shady. business stories. Let's hope he's not a viewer. <laughs> uh, but we'd love to hear your comments, so please drop them in the comment section below. Now for the GTN Tribe, and this week we're over to New York, and it's the City Coach Multisport Squad, sent in by Jonathan Kane. Well, he founded it back in 2000, which is quite a, an old club for triathlon, alongside Christopher Berglund, who is apparently the 24-hour treadmill world record holder. Wow. Well, that's and, got to take some and apparently pretty strong mentality, also, isn't it? Also a three-time Ironman winner and course record holder. Well, so. the club's got a good foundation with that. Yeah. Um, and. Apparently they have quite a good range from world champs, national champs, all the way through to beginners. And they've also got a range of athletes from team members from Europe, from Africa, um, South America as well. Wow. Um, and they've got a few fun things going on in the squad throughout the year. Um, they had one of their athletes, and we've got a great photo I of love it. This. Apparently he's actually also two-time winner of the Regis and Kelly High Heelathon, where you sprint 100 yards in three-inch heels. Do you reckon you could do well in that? No. I I've think seen I'll... you in a dress, Mark. I reckon you could like... I'm not going to tell anyone about that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Okay, moving <laughs> on. Um, they also had the Taco Mile. Maybe that's more up your street. That was for the Mexican earthquake relief. Now, we're not exactly sure what it involved, but we're guessing it's something yeah. along the signs of the, the like, beer mile. Yeah, so maybe a taco every 400 you wouldn't meters want to really, You wouldn't want to add too much like chili onto your taco, would you? For, yeah, for that? that's <laughs> interesting. I, I want to see video footage of that. Um, and then they also have done a simulated race of the race across America, and they've done it on CompuTrainers as an eight-person relay team. So brilliant. Yeah, please keep sending in your GTN tribes using the hashtag GTN tribe over Twitter and over Facebook. Onto the GTM Pain Cave, and we've chosen out a few of our favourites for this week. And our first one's here from Gordon Wiper. And this is, well, first of all, congratulations, Gordon. Looks like you've done very well in a lot of Ironman 70.3 races. The amount of trophies on that. Yeah, I think that's chef. a, I can't quite see where it's from, but that's a first in an Ironman 70.3 for his age group. So that's cool. He's got a quite an old Kona poster up there. And a lot of plaques on the wall as well. I don't know if they're from winning races. If they are, even more impressive. Yeah, very cool. So he's got a Svelo, I think that's the P2, set up on his smart trainer. He's got TV for videos and Zwifting. Yeah, and a bit of vintage sort of furniture going on around it as well. Very cool. Everything. And then moving on, we've got one from Ian Toval and sent in over Facebook. And he's got his Bike set up on a standard on-wheel turbo trainer. Zwift going in front of him. He's well hydrated, both his bottles. Yeah. Ready and a and a planner. I can't. We can't quite tell what races are on the planner, but we'd love um, to know Ian. But yeah, nice and compact. He's got his gym bench there, fan. It's cool. And finally, we have one from Rob Calest sent in over Twitter, and he's got his Quintana Roo set up on a on-wheel turbo trainer again. Um, in amongst all his tools. There's a, a comprehensive work set up there. There's a lot of tools going on. Yeah, I've even noticed he's got a like a wooden hammer or mallet here, which is <laughs> often a bit scary having a hammer around a bike. Well, but... I guess a wooden one's better than a metal one. True, true. Uh, well, we love seeing your pain cave, so please keep sending them using the hashtag GTN Pain Cave over Twitter or send them in over Facebook. That's it for the GTN show, and as always, please keep sending your comments in because we love reading them and we love just seeing what you're up to. Now, today we've been talking a lot about the cold, training in the cold, racing in the cold. Well, this winter, I've been keeping warm on a lot of my training rides in our lovely GTN gear. Well, I must admit, the leggings, the, the cycling leggings are my favourite. I haven't been out that much in the winter, but the couple of rides I have done, they've been an absolute godsend. If you want to get your hands on some of the lovely GTN kit, then why not click on the link for the shop? And if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to GTN for free by clicking on the globe. And if you are starting your training programme for your first ever triathlon, we've put together a great series for you. And one of the videos is just here. Now, perhaps you're playing around with your position on the bike, going from a comfortable position to an aero-aggressive position. And, well, we've tried it out for you. And we've got some interesting results. So you can see that video by clicking here. <laughs>